Hi everyone, this is Jenny Lyles. Welcome to Out of My Mind. Today we are talk taking on purely political topic of safe and legal abortions. So far this year, Georgia, Mississippi, Ohio, Kentucky, and Alabama have all passed restrictive anti-choice laws that are affecting women in those states. The purpose of these laws is to get a test case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court in order for uh, the current conservative majority on the Supreme Court to potentially overturn Roe v. Wade, which has been the law of the land since I was still in diapers. Now, before we get into the health and legal effects of this, I want to dispel a quick notion about Christianity and abortion. The Bible has literally nothing to say about abortion. It is not a piece of what the Bible says. There is not one word. It does, however, in several places, explicitly state that life begins when one draws one's first breath, which happens when one is born. Further, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but prior to the 20th century and into the first half of the 20th century, it was very common for medical professionals and semi-professionals to sell concoctions and teas and various things that, quote, brought on a woman's menses which meant it started her period. Most people are not aware of that, even if they have read books written in that time period, but that is referring to socially acceptable abortions in the first or early second trimesters that have been going on for thousands of years. Now that we've discussed the religious and cultural aspects, I'd like to talk a little bit about what will happen to the health of the women in these states. First, children who have been raped, because remember, if you are under the age of majority in any state, you cannot have sex. There is no such thing. If a child becomes pregnant, a child has been raped, period. So children who have become raped will be, not maybe, will be, and in fact, I believe already are being made to carry their rapist's baby to term, which is extremely dangerous for girls who have just started becoming fertile at 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. This is a very serious health problem because these girls are not going to be equipped to give birth to these children, let alone raise them. Mothers will die from having to deliver unviable babies. I will come back to this in a little bit, but it's important to note that sometimes Babies die before they're born, and if they don't come out, if the system does not work and that baby does not get expelled from the body, that baby can then kill the mother because it will rot within her body. So that is another thing that can happen when you have a strict anti-abortion, anti-choice law for any reason. Another thing is that women will not be able to get effective birth control in some of these states because some of these states are banning such things as birth control, pills, and other hormonal uh, birth control as well as IUDs on the basis that they stop a fertilized egg from being implanted which isn't again entirely true. I'm not going to go deeply into the science of this but it is something that is going to be happening is that women will be denied the forms of birth control that are, first of all, the most reliable, and second, 
the most in control of the woman. One thing many people don't realize is that domestic violence abusers often use pregnancy as a way to further subjugate the women they are attempting to abuse. So they will get a woman pregnant in order to keep her dependent, in order to keep her in their power, and they will refuse to use condoms, they will promise to pull out and not pull out, they will do things so that women are not able to protect themselves from pregnancy. And this does happen, and it's a very common way in domestic violence to keep a woman in that relationship. So that is another health risk from not allowing certain birth controls that some of these laws are claiming are abortifacents. Another health issue is that women will start hiding miscarriages and ectopic pregnancies in states where having an abortion is a felony. Because what will happen when women have miscarriages and show up at the emergency room in the middle of a miscarriage is that they will be forced to sit in that emergency room while the police are called and an investigation is made to determine whether or not that miscarriage was natural. And there's often no way to prove that it is because that's simply the nature of miscarriages. And therefore, women who have done nothing to break the law are in danger of going to jail and women knowing this will avoid seeking medical treatment for miscarriages to avoid jail, which could very well, especially in the case of ectopic pregnancies and other abnormalities that can cause problems with uterine bleeding, um, these could cause severe illness up to and including death. Moving on from the health risks that can come from these laws, I want to talk about the legal issues. We touched on one of those just now, that uh, women will be felons if they are caught having an abortion. A quick statistic for you, whether abortions are legal or illegal in the course of a woman's lifespan, one third of women will typically get an abortion one-third. Most of those women are already mothers. So there are two very glaring legal issues here. First of all, felons can't vote in any of the states that are passing these laws. And that is going to serve the purpose of potentially preventing one-third, one-third of all women in those states over time from being able to vote. Now, of course, we all know that laws like this are prosecuted differentially, and if you are wealthy and or attached to the Republican Party, uh, you will be able to get an abortion regardless of what the law says, because that is the way it has always been in all places where abortion bans happen. However, if you are poor and or brown or black, you are going to be more likely prosecuted not only for an actual planned abortion, but also for miscarriages that happen. And this will again serve one party that doesn't get women to vote for it in as large a number, and it is trying to hold on to power. Now, again, these women are parents and when they are arrested, they can serve up to 99 years in prison. So we are looking at mothers of children being separated from their children, putting more children into the foster care system. And when we consider that we're talking one third of women have abortions in their lifetime, we're talking a very large pr prison population and population of children who grow up without their mothers. 
Now, some of them will have perfectly good fathers to raise them, and that's wonderful, and we're really happy those fathers are there. Uh, others, however, will not, and they will be put into already overcrowded foster care systems that leave somewhere in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of children to age out of foster care in a given year throughout the country already. So we are looking at a situation where an already bad situation for children that don't have enough support will become worse because of these laws. Uh, in a couple of these states, and I don't remember which ones, you can review the statutes yourself. The statute is saying that if a woman leaves the state to have an abortion in another state, upon her return, she can be arrested for having an abortion outside the confines of that state's laws. Now, I am fairly certain that that will not hold up as that is a direct constitutional violation. However, I am not a lawyer and I am not sure. And in any case, the thing that that does is it makes the woman's body the property of the state that says she cannot leave that state to get a procedure elsewhere that is legal under that other jurisdiction. So that is another major legal issue with these. Finally, any time that you create a brand new class of felon, you are giving more power to the police state. And the police state already has too much power. We are already prosecuting people for crimes, not because they make our society better, but because we are thereby controlling the populations they are a part of, such as black people and Native Americans and immigrants, although, in case you have forgotten, immigrants actually commit less crimes, fewer crimes per capita than native-born Americans. What can we do in the case of all these laws? Because these laws are already passed. There's those of us in the feminist movement who've been yelling about this for decades, saying we're going back to the dark ages. And over and over again, we've been saying, not yet, it's not that big a deal. And we've been saying, oh yeah, it is that big a deal and we need to stop this now. And we keep being told it's not that big a deal, that'll never happen. And they were wrong and we were right. So the first thing we need to do is promote scientific literacy for all. It is not possible, for example, to carry an ectopic pregnancy to term. And despite what one of the laws in question believes, it is also not possible to remove a fetus, or actually at that case, a zygote from a fallopian tube or other extra uterine place where it has implanted and re-implant it in the uterus. There are a lot of women who would be thrilled if that particular procedure was available because they have lost children to ectopic pregnancies. But that procedure does not exist at this point in science and therefore we can't actually make that a law because we don't have the science to back it up. Some of these laws are a little less restrictive. They say no abortions after six weeks pregnant. That sounds reasonable. That's a month and a half, right? Except that at six weeks pregnant, a woman has at most missed one period. And most young women are going to have times when they miss periods for things that are not pregnancy that are stress or illness or something like that. And so when a woman is confirmed to be pregnant, she has roughly less than a week to make a decision about an abortion. And much of that week is taken up by prior laws that require uh, videos and a waiting period and things like that. Here's another thing that's a matter of social science. 
Making abortions illegal does not prevent abortions. It doesn't lower them even a little bit. The statistics are always at Guttmacher Institute. You're welcome to look them up yourself. Um, the difference between a place where abortion is legal or illegal is that uh, if it is illegal, women die. Abortion is safer than giving birth. If it is done medically, under controlled situations. If it is a back alley abortion, it is more dangerous and women die. Uh, also, the things that happen to make abortions happen less are to make birth control free and widely available, which of course is not going to happen with these people in charge of these legislatures. So how can we fight this again? We've already talked a little bit about stating some scientific facts. Now we're going to do something that I touched on a little bit a couple weeks ago where we double down instead of backing down when somebody is trying to push our boundaries. So the first thing we say is let's discuss the rights of a corpse versus the rights of a woman. If somebody has said before they die, I do not believe that my body should be allowed to be dismembered after my death and I expressly forbid you to harvest my body for organs, you cannot do that. Even though the body is dead, even though they're going to be cremated, even though none of their organs are being used by them anymore. However, a embryo, a zygote, a fetus can in these states where abortion is illegal, use a woman's uterus against her consent for eight months, potentially damaging it for the rest of her life, potentially causing major problems in her life, and the woman has no recourse in these states. So in these states, a corpse literally has more rights than a living woman. Also, we want to promote the idea that if women are going to be forced to give birth, they have the right to sue for damages for anybody who leaves sperm in their vagina that then causes a pregnancy because of negligence or because of any kind of violence whatsoever. So women should be able to sue rapists for damages. They should be able to sue people who refuse to use a condom for damages. They refuse, if anybody tampers with their birth control, they should be able to sue for damages. Also, if a fetus, zygote, embryo is a human life at conception, then clearly child support needs to begin at conception. So we determine who the father is and the father begins paying child support while the child is still in the womb and the mother, all medical bills should be covered by that father. So we start lobbying for these sorts of laws. Finally, the third one that we want to double down on that we're going to push back on these boundary crossings is we're going to say, you know what, we might not be able to get this passed, but let's go ahead and try. How about we make it a law that every man has to be uh, sterilized through a vasectomy at adolescence and that he cannot get that vasectomy overturned until he has been in a relationship with a woman for two years and that woman has given her consent. Now clearly, especially that last one, that is not intended to pass. What it is intended to do is to highlight the idea that this is a bodily autonomy issue by pointing out to men that they would never tolerate a similar sort of law conducting how their bodies can be dealt with. We can also fight to overturn these laws by voting, voting for new appointers of judges, 
which means legislatures and governors. And for new judges, where that is possible, we need to be checking the choice information of everybody we vote for from dog catcher on up because dog cat catcher is where you start before you become state representative and then state senator and then governor. Now let's talk a little bit about overturning some of the lies that are being told about abortions. Uh, the idea, of course, we go back to the idea that abortions, if they are illegal, stop abortions. That is a lie, and we need to call that out. All it does is kill women. It does not stop abortions. There is no such thing as a post-birth abortion. That is a heinous lie. It is being spread deliberately to incite violence against pro-choice people and therefore needs to be countered loudly and often. And all late-term abortions are carried out for one of three reasons. The first, as I touched on earlier, is that the baby is already dead. It is inside the woman's uterus and if it does not come out, that woman is likely to die herself. The second is that the baby is not dead, but it is dying and it will not survive the birth. And therefore needs to come out because it is damaging the mother. The third reason again comes down to the mother. The mother is ill, the mother is injured, and if she carries this baby any longer, she will die. So these are the reasons that late-term abortions happen. Uh, a baby is born without kidneys, or conceived, I'm sorry. A fetus is found to have no lungs, a fetus is found to have no brain. These things happen, and when these things happen, the most humane thing we can do for everybody is enable that child to be brought into the world, allow the mother and other parents and grandparents a time of mourning, and then move on. But we do not go, ha ha. I've decided I no longer want to be pregnant. I'm eight and a half months pregnant. Get rid of this thing. That does not happen. Now, after children are born, we need to discuss, if you're calling yourself pro-life, you have a lot of work to do. Because let's start with just the idea of poverty. We have roughly a 13% of children in the United States live under the poverty level and an additional something in the neighborhood of 20% live just above the poverty level. These children don't have consistent food, decent shelter, they go to schools that are understaffed and underutilized in terms of resources, they live in unsafe neighborhoods that are plagued by violence, and yet we are saying let's bring more of these children into the world that whose parents can't provide for them and leave them to suffer. Gun violence. We are talking about protecting the rights of zygotes, but our kindergartners can tell us exactly what it feels like to hide from a gunman in their classroom because they have been practicing drills every year and they know they're old pros at hiding from gunmen and children in their teens die because they find loose guns and kill themselves or are shot or kill others. And we need to address that if we want to call ourselves pro-life. Migrant children are living at the U.S. border and in hidden little corners all over the country. They live in cages where they are being physically emotionally and sexually abused on a daily basis in the name of the United States of America. 
And until we address that and condemn that, we cannot call ourselves pro-life. Finally, there's the death penalty. If you are pro-life, you can't say for this particular crime or that particular crime, that person needs to die. If you are pro-life, you need to be pro-life for everyone, even the people you find the most disgusting. And that is a hard position to take, but in most civilized countries, they have taken that position and it works rather well for them. I'd like to see this country do that as well. Finally, one thing we can do to combat all this is tell our own abortion stories. Mine goes something like this. I have never had an abortion, but in 1965, in late spring, the United States had a rubella epidemic. This was prior to when the MMR vaccine, vaccine was available. And uh, rubella is generally a fairly mild disease. However, if you get it while you are pregnant, you are likely to have a child that is profoundly disabled and potentially unable to survive past the first year of life. My mother, who at that time had a four-year-old son and a six-year-old son, who was an alcoholic and who had been diagnosed with bipolar, had her mother dying that spring. She wanted to have a little girl before her mother died. So she and my father tried and conceived a baby. And then she got rubella in the worst stage of pregnancy to get rubella. And this was pre Roe v. Wade, but this was Vermont where people are civilized. And my mother went to her doctor and she went to her minister and she went to her, my father, and she said, hey, what do I do here? I'm not sure that I can, you know, handle having a disabled child. And folks, I am not being ableist here. My mother was severely disabled and very fragile, and I'm not sure she could have raised a severely disabled child. She probably would have had a very hard time with it, and I know she would not have done well with a miscarriage or a stillbirth. So after discussing with my father and with my her minister, who was an Episcopalian priest, and with her doctor, she made the decision to have a medically approved abortion. And she had this sometime in late spring or midsummer of 1965 and I was conceived in October of 1965. Now folks if you can do math you understand that if my mother had not had that abortion the world would not have been blessed with me. Instead it would have been blessed with my older brother or sister who would probably not have lived out more than about a year of their life and who would have probably been in an unsustainable situation because my mother would not have done well with their needs. So that's my abortion story. You probably have your own. Somebody in your family, yourself, has had to struggle with the idea of abortion, has had an abortion, has made a decision one way or another, and lived with it, and or has had a pregnancy that ended in miscarriage or something like that. Share those stories when we're talking about choice. Talk about the health risks of pregnancy and how important it is that women can decide for themselves whether or not they can handle those health risks. In any case, I am done with purely political right now and I will return to purely mental health topics in the next couple of weeks. I will be right here doodling, coloring, knitting, playing video games, and talking to you from out of my mind. Don't forget, if you want to see other videos, go to oomm.live or patreon.com backslash jlil.
S. Thank you very much, and I hope that you tune in again to these videos twice a week for as long as I'm doing. Talk to you later. Thank you.